They did a year long trial on artificial sweeteners and your microbiome. And did they tell everything that they found about the microbiome? And does it really matter to you? Let's uncover the truth. I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional misinformation online. In this video, we're going to hear from Nutrition Made Simple, or Dr. Gill, and he's a good reviewer of articles for sure. Let's see what he says and be sure to wait till the end of the video to get my final thoughts. Before we dive into today's video, I want to invite you to join the Academy's free webinar, The Power of Protein, Telltale Signs You Need More Protein, hosted by Dr. Michael Eads and Dr. Mary Dan Eads. They've appeared as nutritional experts on hundreds of radio and television shows across the U.S. and continue to speak at medical and scientific conferences on the connection between diet, health, exercise, and low-carb and ketogenic diets. See the link in the description to sign up. One of the largest randomized trials on artificial sweeteners just dropped. It lasted one year and they recruited almost 400 people. 341 adults and 38 children, all overweight or obese, were recruited and started the trial. For the adults, which were the bulk of the participants, the trial had two phases. An initial two-month weight loss phase where everybody went on a low-calorie diet, and then a 10-month weight maintenance phase. So they were expected to lose weight initially and then try to maintain that weight loss. Well, I like the study design in a couple ways that it's looking at people who might come to me in my office, in my clinic. I have a diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity reversal practice at Duke University. And so I like the idea that it's a clinical study with people who are losing weight. It didn't tell us how they necessarily would have to lose the weight or maintain it. But the main question is whether artificial sweeteners would be okay compared to the regular sugar uh, in the in the drinks and in the food, and to look at the microbiome as well. So a low calorie diet for two months, then a weight maintenance for ten months. Well, in my practice, I would probably have you losing weight for that entire time. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. But this is a start. That at least it's a clinical population. That initial phase did work. During those initial two months, they lost an average of ten kilos. So that initial weight loss phase was the same for everyone. Wow, so two months and 10 kilos, so that, that's good weight loss for sure. And then with the weight loss, the dietary input changes. Of course, your microbiome will reflect in many ways what you're eating. And so here they're trying to select out just looking at the artificial sweetener effect on the microbiome. Then during the weight maintenance phase, the 10 months that followed, the participants were split randomly into two groups. Everybody moderated added sugars, refined carbohydrates. They were supposed to keep it under 10% of calories. And then on top of that, one of the groups replaced as much sugar as possible with sweeteners or sweetness enhancers. This includes all kinds of sweeteners, aspartame, esosulfame, potassium, saccharin, erythritol, sorbitol, xylitol, etc. So they're looking at all sweeteners combined, right? They're not differentiating specific type of sweetener. This is important about the design. And the other group, the control group, was not allowed to eat anything with artificial sweeteners. And basically they were looking at, over those 10 months, how did these two groups do in terms of holding on to the weight loss, to keeping their weight off? So it's comparing sweeteners to sugar, there's no water group, which sometimes in trials there is. We'll come back to this. They confirmed that the participants were compliant, that they were doing as told with two methods. One was food records. Participants were asked to keep food records for four-day intervals. They had a second method. They could measure biomarkers of artificial sweeteners in the urine, and they confirmed that those were significantly higher in the group allowed to eat sweeteners than the group not allowed. Among the adults, the consumption of sugar-rich products came down by about 100 grams, 107 grams a day more in the sweetener group than the sugar group and added sugar itself by 12 grams more. We well, you know the controversy about artificial sweeteners is multiple. There are several controversies. One is that it's just as unhealthy as sugar. People come to me saying, well, I can't have diet drinks. And I would say, well, why not? The diet drinks don't raise the blood glucose, don't raise the insulin. So if you're trying to address the carbohydrate, insulin, obesity, and carbohydrate 
blood sugar diabetes pathways, then the diet sodas will be fine. But other people will say that over time, studies have shown that the artificial sweeteners lead to less weight loss because people will just have more sugar. But if you're not allowed to have the sugar and just allowed to have artificial sweeteners, like I recommend to my patients, you're not ever going to go back to the sugar. So in the context of a low carb or keto diet, if you're not going ever back to the sugary drinks, it may be fine. And it, and it really kind of gets rid of that second criticism that someone will just go back to sugar. Now, the, the third very practical idea about artificial sweeteners, though, in terms of just kind of addictive substances, the sweetness, sometimes we have a discussion and it's better not to have the sweetness at all. Rather, even if it's artificial sweeteners or non-sugar sweeteners, because over time you might relapse back to the real sugar. That's a discussion when you've reached your goal, basically. But I do allow people to have artificial sweeteners. And, and here I, I would predict that the weight loss would be better if you only let people have the non-sugar sweeteners than, than the sugar, right? Doesn't that make sense? Okay. So what happened to weight loss? They did see a benefit in the sweeter group. They kept an extra 1.6 kilos, which is about three or four pounds off by the end of the year compared to the sugar group. And then looking at groups of people according to compliance, big difference there. In the most compliant group, the result is about twice as good. So an extra 3.7 kilos kept off on the sweeteners compared to the sugar. So that 1.6 kilos main overall average result is probably an underestimate of the potential of switching from sugar to sweeteners for two reasons. One is that it depends on compliance. The second is that, remember, these folks were not on a standard Western diet. All of them were reducing their sugar to under 10%, right? So if you took somebody on a typical American diet and switched all the sugars to sweeteners, you'd probably see a bigger benefit. The hip circumference was also significantly lower on sweeteners than on sugar. And then a number of other metrics were lower at the six-month mark on the sweeteners, but by the one-year mark were no longer significantly lower. That included BMI, cholesterol, both total, and LDL, and non-HDL cholesterol. So why did they lose significance? Same issues we've talked about. Number of people is lower, so you have less power, or maybe the compliance goes down with time, which is common to see in trials. Now, there's a caveat to this trial. There's actually a few, but one of them is a lot of dropouts. So 40% of the participants that started dropped out before the end of the trial, did not complete. That's because the trial took place during COVID, the pandemic. So logistics were a nightmare. But yeah, when you have a lot of dropouts, it creates concerns because it can bias the results. Right. So when you have dropouts, and there typically are dropouts in clinical trials, if there's a systematic reason for why someone's dropping out compared to one group or another. So you want to know, is the rate of the dropout similar in both groups? Let's say you did a study of a drug and, and a third of the people stopped the drug because of side effects and the placebo had no dropouts. You know pretty much that the people who got that shot, it wasn't necessarily unblinded if someone was getting lots of side effects from the drug. So here, apparently, we'll just say that the pandemic, covid led to a, a non-differential dropout between the two groups. But so far, what we've learned is that having, in a weight loss context, having the availability of, our, no, the recommendation of having artificial sweeteners and not sugar does lead to longer maintenance of the weight loss over that one year period. And in general, that's what I see, where I let people, or I advise people to have the non-sugar sweeteners if they want it or if they feel compelled to have a sweetness at the beginning, I would highly recommend that you have the diet soda instead of the sugar to get you off the sugar. And in a clinic visit recently, I met someone who had to do what I did, which was to have bowls of sugar-free jello at the beginning to get you off the sugar. So a lot of people have that sort of withdrawal craving. And if we didn't have the artificial sweeteners or non-sugar sweeteners, they would relapse back to sugar, for sure. Now, what is more interesting and novel is that they looked at the microbiome changes after one year on these two diets. And changes in microbiome have been reported before, but in much smaller trials, usually much shorter, and the results are inconsistent. Some trials indicate a change in microbiome on sweeteners. Some don't. 
Well, you know, <laughs> the microbiome is something new, and we've been using an approach that's been around 150 years that has worked without even talking about the microbiome. So I haven't yet heard or learned something new to add to my treatment, which has been around for a long time, without regard to the microbiome. In fact, the microbiome changes when you do a carnivore or a keto diet. And what I see clinically is that the microbiome calms down. So the irritable bowel syndrome calms down. Even in some people, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis calms down. So I'm not particularly worried about finding something bizarre about low carb diets. But here, this is the context of losing weight and maintaining it now on non-sugar sweeteners. Another thing they also reported were side effects, and those were more common on the sweeteners, mainly GI symptoms. So gut pain, cramps, loose stool gas, things like that. The methane producing bugs could account for that. Also, some of the sweeteners are sugar alcohols like sorbitol, mannitol. Those in some people can have that effect. The last thing they measured was a number of other metabolic markers, things like insulin, glucose, blood pressure, liver fat, and there was no significant difference in any of those metrics between the two groups. So that's a good thing, that the introducing of non-sugar sweeteners didn't have some adverse metabolic effect beyond the, the weight loss or the microbiome change. A couple of comments. I know he's going through this pretty fast, but the idea of having 300 people in a clinical trial, it's pretty good sized, but compare that to studies that have tens of thousands of people in them. That's where he's starting to talk about power. Power is a tough concept for some people to understand. It means how likely are you to be able to see an effect? So if you have, you know, thousands and thousands of people, they say it's highly powered or you're able to find this effect with X amount of power. Usually percentage is what you would use. Uh, how likely are you to be able to find some kind of difference like that? So in a study of hundreds of people with two groups, you're not going to be powered to find very small differences. In the classic studies looking at 8% versus 7% placebo-controlled studies, you need 20,000 people per group to be able to find that kind of difference. And so a study like this, if you do find something, that's great. But as he says, you're not going to be, if you don't find something, it doesn't mean it's not there at a possibly significant, clinically significant rate. We've seen for many years that sweeteners are linked to all kinds of metabolic issues like overweight, heart disease, and diabetes. But we have to remember that people who are overweight tend to go for the artificial sweeteners more often because they're trying to lose weight. So it creates this association between the sweeteners and the diseases that come as a result of the overweight. But the sweeteners might just be an innocent bystander and not the cause of those problems. So this is where randomized trials such as the one that just came out that we're talking about are so crucial, especially longer durations, a year or more. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So association does not mean causation. You really need to have these prospective randomized trials, experimental design to know about causation. Because things like liver fat can be seen in a couple of months going up or down. And so if in trials we see that in randomized trials, then that points to actually the sweeteners causing it. If we don't see it, it suggests that it's this spurious association, this innocent bystander effect in observational studies, but that the sweeteners are not causing liver fat to increase. So it's interesting and somewhat reassuring that we don't see an increase in liver fat in this trial, but I think it's still TBD. Meaning the, the study wasn't powered enough to be able to see what might be a clinically relevant difference. So hundreds of people in two groups, you might not see small changes is what he's saying there. Last question that a lot of people asked actually on social media and the reaction to this study was, okay, well, this is kind of gaming the system. You're comparing sweeteners to sugar. Of course, the sweeteners are going to look better. Yeah, but that's kind of what the sweeteners are for, right? The whole point of these products of the diet soda and stuff like that is to replace the regular product. So comparing these products to sugar versions to regular soda is absolutely essential. That's, I would say that's the main question we have to answer. Now, is it also interesting 
to compare diet soda to water? Absolutely, because you want to know, are they just better than sugar, which is important, or are they completely harmless that we can drink diet soda or water and it's a wash? So there's two levels to this. Just at the level of weight loss, we know that the artificially sweet drinks like diet soda are very effective. In fact, in randomized trials, they routinely beat water for weight loss, which is kind of mind-blowing for people who hear it for the first time. But we see this over and over. We even see it in meta-analyses. People who go to diet soda lose more weight than people who swap the regular soda with water. How can that be? Because of secondary behaviors, right? Probably because the diet soda satiates that sweet tooth and you don't have to go eat something sweet right after, whereas the water doesn't scratch that itch and you're probably going to go eat something else. And so overall calories probably explain this. So for weight loss alone, the diet soda seems to be a very good tool for people who are overweight and who consume a lot of soda and they swap it with diet soda. Now, yeah, I agree. So if you're worried about doing low carb keto or carnivore and you're worried about giving up sugar, well, sugar is what's causing a lot of the damage. And so switching to either a diet soda that doesn't raise the sugar in the blood, doesn't raise the insulin in the blood or water, flavored waters work as well. If you look at total carbs on any of these products, total carbs, zero G, zero grams, that's going to be what you want to look for. Not net carbs on the front or the packaging or the marketing materials, but total carbs, zero G. The diet sodas, the waters uh, fulfill that. And that's what you're looking for metabolically, the absence of sugar. Yeah, good video, good review, and also good critique of a new article looking at artificial sweeteners during the weight loss process. And you were able to maintain the weight loss better if you were using, well, advised to use randomized to artificial sweeteners or having sugar again and you were able to maintain that weight loss which is kind of what we expected right so i'm not worried about the long-term kinds of issues even although you don't have to stay on these for long term as he's saying use the diet soda non-sugar sodas or, or, or drinks to get off the sugar and then decide what to do you don't have to maintain them forever and, you know, it'd be interesting to do a study of water versus diet soda. As he says, maybe there is something better in terms of the other food consumed or, you know, the uh, quenching of the, the, the need for sweet, which he, you know, Gil, Dr. Gill doesn't talk about sugar addiction yet in this video, but if you have sugar addiction, you're going to be very careful to not go back to that sugar and using something like sugar-free product, maybe lifetime sort of answer for the sugar addiction. I think that uh, Dr. Gill does a great job in this video. And if you like, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, and look for new content on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, consider joining our YouTube membership for early access and exclusive live Q&As with me. Just click the join button below or support us with a PayPal in the description.